how long have you been programming? Well, my programming history is a little bizarre. So I started off as a little kid. I went to this high uh, this this elementary school called PS197 in Brooklyn, New York. Let's see if I can find it here. Public School 197, the King's Highway Academy. Do they change the name? This is a like extremely good school, but a public school, nothing special. This is the this is definitely the video or the, the photo. This is definitely what it looked like. I think it still more or less looks like that. East 22nd Street. I actually remember the, the teacher and everything, but we used uh, the Apple IIe. And so we started with uh, this program or this computer programming basic. And mostly we were running, just shoving floppy disks in there to run video games or educational games, but we did a little bit of basic as well. And so that's what started off my programming career. Uh, there, was a, there was also this turtle program called Logo or Logos. And it was a educational, basically, programming language. And you could use it to make little graphics and do little things. You basically instruct it with these repeats and loops. So you basically learn a little bit about for loops and stuff like that. And as a young child, I had this stuff like really ingrained into my head. So I spent most of my childhood, when I got my own computer, um, learning something called QBasic. And that's why I named my cat Nibbles, because the basic uh, QBasic program that ships with is called, basic, uh, is called Nibbles. And so I was actually able to talk with the guy who created Nibbles, which was really fun, uh, who worked at Microsoft in the 80s. But uh, QBasic uh, was the successor of QuickBasic. And uh, Microsoft's first products were basic related. So after basic, I was around 12 years old and the next hurdle was Visual Basic and Pascal and C. And I learned a little bit of Pascal and a little bit of C. But when it came to object-oriented programming, it's when I gave up and I started doing other things. I did guitar, I did basketball, um, and I, I started to focus on the opposite sex. <laughs> I started to focus on stocks. And I ended up um, kind of around 12 to 15, giving up on programming I was very interested in the internet in general. Um, so I had a little bit of a hand in programming, but I had a little hand in like hacking and networking and stuff like that, and just the internet in general. And then I started on Wall Street and then I kind of stopped programming completely. Um, and that was a long stretch of time. And then I got arrested uh, and I ended up um, learning JavaScript. So I wrote my first lines of JavaScript, just sitting around waiting for my trial waiting for my um, criminal trial to start. And uh, I learned a lot of JavaScript with um, some guy I met on the internet and it was so much fun. And we stayed up all night programming and it was such a blast. It reminded me of my days as a kid. The problem is I still had a lot of like bad programming habits. So I'm not a good programmer. <laughs> um, I'm nowhere near some of my colleagues who are tremendous at what they do. I'm not that. I think it's still important to know about technology if you're going to be in technology. Um, so I, I try as hard as I can. Uh, I want to be a great programmer, but I also know that there's more to starting a software company than being a programmer. Um, a lot of great software executives were never programmers, but most of them were at some point. So to me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a student of technology and always interested in technology, but I also want to, uh, you know, make make products and make money. Um, those are two very different things. So, you know, trying to, to make sure you can leverage one into the other is not always easy. So anyway, that's my programming background in history. So now I'm like a junior developer. Um, I, I could probably I could probably make eighty to one hundred thousand dollars working at a software company as a junior JavaScript programmer. So. <laughs> I didn't start with Visual Basic. Visual Basic wasn't around when I started programming, but you can learn Basic in five minutes. Well, Microsoft wanted to dominate the programming world, right? So, so they had uh, Microsoft Visual Studio, which has morphed now into to VS Code, right? But way back when, remember, Microsoft started by making Basic interpreters for the Altair and other Basic uh, interpreters. So. Microsoft's lineage comes from like literally making uh, programming language tools. And there was another company at, around the same time called Borland 
that made Turbo Pascal. And I remember my mother bought me, she brought me, uh, my mom worked at NYU. My mom brought me a bunch of Turbo Pascal discs and books that were being discarded. And I read those as a teenager. Uh, and then when I went to this high school, they had Turbo Pascal there. So I was able to write a little Pascal. Um, but the point is, uh, uh, Microsoft wanted to take their domination of programming languages, pre-GUI programming languages, to the GUI. And that's why they created Visual Basic. It didn't work out. Um, it didn't work out for a lot of reasons. <laughs> but, um, you know, C, the C libraries for Windows still still became very important for making and writing Windows apps. So. Uh, but they didn't. They weren't able to sort of get this stronghold around the entire ecosystem. They're getting it back to some extent with uh, VS Code, interestingly. And now they own GitHub, and now they kind of semi-own OpenAI. So Microsoft. Uh, I always was rooting for Microsoft as a kid. It's funny. There was uh, so much hate for Microsoft uh, in '94. I loved Bill Gates. I thought he was the coolest guy in the world. Uh, and everyone hated him. Everyone in the media made fun of him for being too rich, too dominating, too this, too that. And I kind of looked at that with like this reverence of like, yeah, this is a, this is the kind of guy I want to be like. He's too too alpha. <laughs> this is why America is great, right? You can be like that and, and shrug it all off your shoulders. And you know, Bill Gates spent the next twenty years of his life trying to repair his reputation as a ruthless Machiavellian business person. And in the software industry, he was hated by most purists in software who were programmers or hackers or what have you. Uh, they were rooting for the open source movement. They were rooting for Apple. They were rooting for Linux. They were rooting for anything but Bill Gates. And like, you know, times have changed. You know, Microsoft is a much friendlier kind of company. Uh, they successfully, you know, repaired their their image. Uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, it's just sort of funny to see, uh, see how it's all evolved over, over time. But I think that it's important to be diverse, uh, when you have a company, I know that a lot of people disagree with that and it's not something I'm going to compromise on. I think when you have a company, you have to have more than one product line and there's never been a company that's had one product line and only one product line because that company would fail. Um, and so I think that you need to be you know, somebody who are diverse while focused. Um, it's funny because as I, as I talk to people about our company, we have three products and it's, it's, it's kind of crazy for a young company to have three products, but why we have three products, how we came into having three products, we created two of them. One of them we kind of inherited, um, and one of them is, I wouldn't call it back burner, but it's, it's sort of in maintenance mode. It, you never know where your success will come from. And Microsoft is actually a great example of that. When Microsoft started in 1975, they didn't have DOS for another, I want to say six years or seven years, which was their first, um, first major product. And Microsoft tried to make a mouse. Microsoft even had Microsoft Publishing, which was... No joke, it was a book company. And if you were one of Bill Gates' investors, can you imagine in 1988, if you went to Bill Gates and said, I can't believe you started a book company. This is crazy. Was it 1988? Let me see when Microsoft Publishing began. It was earlier than that, actually. But what a distraction for a software company, right? What a weird, weird distraction. Why would you start Microsoft Press? And their first book was about the Apple Macintosh. And this is 1984. So this is nine years into Microsoft. They started a book company. And imagine if you went to Bill Gates and said, I'm selling all their stock because you started a book company and you're supposed to be focused. You're supposed to be focused on making software and you're starting a book company. And I'm pantomiming some dumb VC that says, oh, you got to focus or you'll lose. Well, I don't know, Bill, this looks like very unfocused. Like, why would Microsoft start a video game? Uh, uh, well, they, they also did a video game company. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
uh, why would they start a, a, a book company? The Microsoft mouse was also a huge failure. Microsoft had many years of failure in hardware. 1983, they came out with this mouse. 200 bucks, look at that. Looks like garbage now. It's probably worth $1,000 if you still have one. Look at how ugly that is. The Microsoft mouse. Can you imagine being an investor in this company and saying, you're making hardware? You're making these tchotchkes that some Chinese or Japanese company is making for you and you're selling them for 10% margin? How in the world is this a good idea? Right? And I think the, the answer is, in hindsight, the answers are always obvious. But at the time... When you're sitting, if you've, I, I played a little bit of organized sports as a kid. You're sitting in the pocket as the quarterback or the point guard with the basketball. It's not easy. <laughs> you don't, your vision of the field isn't always obvious what's going to work and what isn't. And you don't exactly know at the time, at that second, oh, you know, he's wide open or, or whatever. And you're the one who has to make the decision. And it's not a perfect analogy because... You know, you can take advice from other people, but if you want to try something that you think is going to be successful, you don't know what feedback you got and how good that feedback was. So some people probably said, yeah, this is a great idea. Do the mouse. And somebody might have said, no, this is an awful idea. Why are you expanding into hardware? And that person was right. The mouse was a bad idea. Um, but if you look at Apple, they made a lot of money in peripherals. So Apple would have been wrong if you told Apple, don't make your AirPods. Why would you make headphones? That's not your business. Well, they made headphones and they, it worked. If you told Apple, don't make these other peripherals, well, you would have been wrong. So it's not like there's some playbook where you just run the playbook and you always it always works. So little Nam in my chat room is saying something exactly right. If you fail fast, it, you can do a lot of different things. If you fail slowly and, and dig over and over again into something, uh, you may not uh, succeed. Now, Microsoft sort of made it a priority to win in hardware and win in search, and they never gave up on either. They also made it a priority to win in video games. So Microsoft had a video game division way before Xbox. And as some of you may know, their biggest product for a long time was Flight Simulator. And the Flight Simulator certainly looks like a distraction. You know, this is a very, very bizarre thing for a software company to sort of uh, come out with. Um, you know, you're talking about 1981, 1982. You know, this is a very bizarre, you know, 40 years ago, Microsoft fights Flight Simulator. 40 years ago. This is before Windows. You know, would, wouldn't you as an investor or board member said, oh, Mr. Gates, I don't know. Why would you be making video games? You make office productivity software. What are you doing? And you know what? They would have been right. Microsoft never made a lot of money from Flight, flight Simulator. But the point is, like, if you know how to run a business, you can put five people on Flight Simulator or 10 people. You don't have to put the whole the company on it. And, you know, there's a way to manage through these things that's, that's, that's not... Uh, you know, going to really cripple the company if, if, if you make a small bet on something like Flight Simulator. And my, my, get, my, best, my, get, my best guess is they probably did fairly well in Flight Simulator. I mean, you don't make 20 versions of a product if, if you fail at it. So I'm, I'm assuming this was actually a pretty good P&L or return on invested capital for Microsoft over the long run. They still, they just introduced another Flight Simulator version. So they, uh, they uh, certainly didn't mess it up. And the other funny thing is their interest in Flight Simulator and a couple other video games, I know their history very, very well. Microsoft put out lots of video games over the years uh, before Xbox. They finally decided to make Xbox. And so maybe it was these little experiments that allowed them to learn the space and slowly introduce a major product like Xbox, which has done very, very well. So sometimes you need to experiment. You know, Microsoft also tried media, so they had publishing. But then, as you all know, they did MSNBC, which was an attempt to do media. They did the MSN network. They did, uh, uh, of course, the ISP. And all those things were, were kind of very not so great, but there was an attempt to sort of do it all. Uh, when they saw AOL Time Warner, they kind of felt like they needed to do something similar with uh, 
that AOL to, to what AOL was doing. So, so many different, you know, uh, things to think about and look at, but I, I, I think it's important to have a diverse company that doesn't just rely on one product, even though we want all of our products to be as big as possible. Some products aren't destined to be that big. Um, you know, the, the, the molecular uh, energetics product that we put out is never going to be a major product because it's just not a big product for anyone. Uh, so it's not going to be that big of a product for us, but our financial product, that could be a really big product. This product I just talked about, AI physician assistant, could be a very, very big product. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, you just have to sort of frame everything, you know, the right way. <coughs> what do you all want to do?